Thank you, Bill. Bill asked me if I was talking, and I have been just rambling and rambling, but I have my mic muted, so that was fun. Uh, yeah, so anyway, <laughs> ask me anything. Is We'll start over. Ask me anything, folks. Ask me anything. It's your chance to get your ban burning banjo questions answered. I was mentioning earlier, while the mic was muted, that um, I hadn't intended on going live to everybody on YouTube again, but it was already set up that way. So we're just rolling with it and let me turn off my audio monitoring Whew. 
All right, let me know if there's any more technical troubles. Bill says all good. I can see I got some messages from some other folks too. I'm going to get to you. I'm trying to make sure I have everything set up. My mic is unmuted now. Uh, I turn my audio monitoring. Uh, probably need to turn that off. Okay, hopefully we're rolling. Anyway, I was saying before, while the mic was muted, that I am accidentally going live to YouTube. But hey, all you out there on YouTube who aren't actually members, this is usually our weekly secret members only. Ask me anything. It's not so secret if you're here at the playbetterbanjo.com members area. Uh, in the last couple weeks, we've gone live out to everybody. And this week we're doing it accidentally, so you get one more. Uh... And maybe some of you will come in and join us. Last week, a few of you uh, enjoyed the session and kind of came over and joined up in the membership. So we love to have you. Uh, so we heard from Brother Bill. It's 30 degrees Fahrenheit and gray on Vashon Island. It is gray here, but not so not so chilly. It's supposed to be up to like 75 today. Get a nice gray, a gray, warm windy wet spring day kelly and i are heading to puerto rico in a few days so we're going to escape this final sputtering last few weeks of uh, spring here in the midwest it's never very fun such a such a weather tease speaking of living in gray places we've got uk tony he said heavy rain today eight degrees celsius Hopefully we have seen the last of the frost. Tomato plants are coming on in the greenhouse. That's cool. That's good to know. You already got tomato plants rolling. And yeah, I think um, we're hoping we've seen the last of the frost here. We've got some stuff in the ground, some stuff here growing in the kitchen. It's all happening. Uh, it's good to hear a little update on the tomato plants, Tony. We like to follow. We like to keep track of you. You and your greenhouse. Uh, oh, and Tony also says he loves the Muddy River tune. Cool. I got a lot of good feedback on that. And uh, I was just kind of following my bliss there, having a little fun with some Grateful Dead. Um, might do some more Dead tunes in the future because I got a lot of good positive feedback on that. I had a few folks asking for some Olden in the Way, which, of course, Jerry Garcia played banjo in that band. So um, it makes sense. So I'll try to do that. Um... Uh, I got another message that you can't hear me, but I'm I'm hoping that's a delayed one there, Tony. I think you're probably on a delay. Um, so when you get to this point <laughs> in the video, maybe confirm that you can indeed hear me. I'm going to back up. Uh, okay, Bill can hear me because he's saying, tell us about Puerto Rico. And, and Beebs was saying he can see me, but he can't hear me. So you all are on a bit of a delay. So I'm a I'm pretty far ahead of you. I'm about four or five minutes ahead of you for some reason. Uh, but you should be able to hear me now. Bill pointed out right in the beginning that uh, <laughs> that my mic was muted. And so we are good. So I'm going to keep, let everybody settle in here. I'm going to put this up a lot because when we have these, these versions going out to the public, just so everybody knows, you can... Uh, you can ask me anything. Chance to get your banjo questions answered. Tony says, all good. So Tony can hear me now, too. I oh, love it. Nothing like some good old-fashioned... Good old-fashioned technical issues to get us started. Wouldn't be... Wouldn't be a regular weekly session without them. Bill says, tell us about Puerto Rico. Um... It's it's a uh, <laughs> I love going to Puerto Rico. We know a few folks who live there, uh, which got us starting to go visit not too long ago, uh, about four years ago, and we went there a few years back with a few of Kelly's siblings, a few of her many siblings. Had a great time. Decided to make it an annual trip, and then uh, COVID swept in and thwarted the last two years. And uh, you know we still had deposits down on a on a vacation rental so we're heading out there this week uh for that very rentally we uh locked down two or three years ago so we're getting back out there should be great should be a nice break so with that in mind i'm sending out emails this week so you all will see uh, that 
there will we're not going to do a lesson or the ask me anything next week taking an actual vacation i'll probably answer some emails because i i'm always checking in to make sure nobody's having any emergencies with their accounts or anything but for the most part i'm going to take an actual about eight to ten day vacay um and i've already been digging into some puerto rican Quattro music. I don't know if y'all are familiar. I'll take this down for now. Uh, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Puerto Rican Quattro. It's a really interesting folk instrument that the uh, mountain farmers traditionally, the Ibarro of Puerto Rico, are what's known as. The, I've heard it translated. I, think, I believe the Smithsonian translates Ibarro as hillbilly. <laughs> and it's uh, the, as far as I understand, the Ibarro folks are the farmers who live in the inland mountains traditionally in puerto rico and you know do some mountain farming it's always fascinating to watch people farm steep rocky hillsides uh, but uh there's a big tradition there and obviously it's heavily influenced by the spanish colonization and so the instrument the cuatro it's very similar it's a lute style instrument similar to a lot of other instruments but it's it looks like a big violin guitar, violin-shaped guitar, basically, with uh, the modern version has 10 strings, but it's, it's chorused strings, so it's like a, uh, it's like a mandolin or a 12-string guitar, right? So it's a 10-string, but you, you think of it as five choruses, right? So uh, pretty interesting. Check out the quattro, just how it's spelled, the number four. So traditionally, the quattro's had four strings or four choruses. Um, and the modern version has five to add an extra bass note on the bottom. It's all tuned in fourths. So um, the last couple times I've been in Puerto Rico, I was interested in kind of seeking out some quattros and maybe some quattro players and makers, and I had, hadn't got around to it. Spent too much time uh, visiting and hanging out in the ocean, I guess. So this time I'm going to try to do a little exploration, might meet up with a luthier or a player or two, um, and see what happens. I've been talking to a couple people online and um, I take a little adventure. I'll try to take y'all with me. If I do, I'll try to capture some footage or some photos and maybe I'll bring back a quattro. Who knows? Um, I do see some questions rolling in. I love it. I've got a couple questions backed up too, so this is good. We're going to have plenty to talk about. Um, that's my Puerto Rico update for now. Um, I thought about trying to transcribe one of those tunes for our lesson this week, a, a Puerto Rican uh, Ibarro tune, but we'll maybe do that next time. Um, Bill had a question. Curious why you went to that tuning with Capo 3 on Black Muddy River. Let's start there. I'm going to answer your questions that you have here in the chat. Uh, also, folks on YouTube, I'm talking to the members right now, but folks on YouTube, you can chat there too. And... I already have a question in there, so this is good. We're going to have a bunch of questions. Uh, so keep your questions rolling, and I will get to them as best I can. We'll start with, curious why you went with that tuning with the capo on three for Black Muddy River. Good question, and it's a question I, I would love to answer over and over. And I kind of I kind of walked through it in part one of the, because I did two sessions with Black Muddy River, and the first one I just took you along with me while I listened I picked the studio recording of the dead doing it. I listened. I figured out what key it was in. Then I tried to figure out a tuning that would work. Kind of figured out the melody and, or the chord progression. Then I made sure I knew the chord progression numerically and not just key specifically because they were in the key of A. So I figured out that chord progression, figured out what that really was fundamentally beneath the key of A, just how the one, fours, fives, and all that worked. Then I started looking for a key that would work for my vocals. So that's why I ended up on the third fret in the double C tuning. So the double C tuning kind of came because, um, well, first, before the tuning was even a thing, I said, okay, A is cool. That's where they're playing it. I've got all the info I need. Now I'm going to find something that works for my vocal range. Most of us are not blessed with a super dynamic vocal range i have a pretty small range and uh you know you can obviously train yourself to to expand that but you know some folks are just kind of naturally a little have a little more 
longitude to work with when they're singing. Others of us like have to just kind of find, and, and even wonderful, super talented singers, we all find a key that maybe optimizes you know, our vocal strengths for any song. So I could play a song like Black Muddy River in A. Uh-oh. I'm in a weird tuning, but... tuning in down a whole step now I'm probably more or less in open G tuning more or less standard tuning uh, so I could do black muddy river in a when the last rose of summer pricked my finger and the hot sun chills me to the bone uh, this wasn't a great key for me to sing it in, so I started searching around for other keys, and that's what I recommend you do anytime you learn a song. Start looking for different, uh, cycle through different keys and see what matches your vocal range the best, or just your vocal stylings, right? So I ended up, even in that first video, kind of figuring out, oh, I'm probably going to end up about an E-flat. So that is what led me to going to a double C tuning, which had turned out the melody... melody laid out nice and logically in that tuning and that was a good uh, fortuitous situation for me because I thought I can just take the key of C and the double C tuning and just capo it up to E flat and there it matches my vocal range a little better I didn't o spend I didn't overly think that and spend too much time with it I was doing it this mostly for exploration and learning purposes and sharing purposes um, so there might be a more optimal key for me to sing that in, but that worked out pretty well, and I gauged that pretty well. It's going to be somewhere around E flat where I would end up as an optimal key. So that's why I went with the capo on the third fret. Uh, anytime I'm capoing up, unless I'm just emulating somebody I'm learning from and trying to make it correlate with some something for uh, for the sake of teaching, uh, anytime I'm capoing, it's it's generally to uh, accommodate. My vocals if I'm just doing a solo banjo and singing uh, using the capos to accommodate the vocals and get it in the key I want okay one question down um, let's see this may be a comment I don't know we'll get to the end we'll find out if there's a question beep says uh, Ryan we explored Lena Hughes and her playing Lena Hughes is an amazing uh, Missouri multi-instrumentalist but around here really well known for her banjo accompaniment for old time uh, among other musical accomplishments so there's a great Tompkins, Tompkins Square album of her finger style playing uh, anyway we explored Lena Hughes and her playing I found Etta Baker this week whose guitar playing is as wonderful as Lena's pretty similar too I'd say I understand she also played banjo but have yet to find recordings have you heard of her do you know about her banjo style and then he said he sent a link on email of her playing and also good morning good morning to you too Biebs um, I should say Biebs some of our newer members I've noticed are uh, all fellow educators we have a lot of educators here in the, the end up here in play better banjo keeping me honest uh, Biebs being an educator man himself uh, yeah so I'm familiar with Edda you know I never not overly familiar with her, but I definitely know what her style's about as far as her recorded stuff. Um, there's stuff out there of her playing banjo for sure. I th you can find some online, and I don't know what... If you do, you know, digital streaming music services, you should be able to find her. I know on Apple Music, there's a collection of her doing guitar and banjo. One thing I could be wrong about, but that I think I know about Ed Baker, is I don't think she really sang. At least the recordings that I've spent a little time with were just instrumental. Um, and Lena Hughes would be the same way if you listen to her finger-picking album or you hear her playing banjo. She's accompanying other fiddlers, usually. Um, 
so pretty interesting. There are some similarities there. I know Taj Mahal was a is a fan of Etta Baker. I know he hung out with her a little bit and uh, was a proponent of her playing. Uh, so that's a good ringy endorsement. So yeah, there's some there's some banjo stuff out there. Um, do do do. Do you know about her banjo style? You know I don't, but let's check. Let's check out her banjo style. I'm gonna go onto the World Wide Web, onto YouTube, and we're gonna go. Betty Baker banjo. And let's see what happens. I'm guessing we'll get an instrumental banjo. This is the album I was thinking of right here. Does she sing on these? She must. I might have really lied to you. Oh, somebody's got her playing. Uh, that's probably a homespun video there of her actually playing. Okay, let's see. Oh, we need volume. Maybe I wasn't wrong. I don't hear any singing on this. So these are a lot of songs that you're used to hearing vocals on that I, you know, as far for as far as I know, she just played uh, instrumentally on these. Uh, let's listen to this style for a second and see. This is going down the road feeling bad, so it's probably an open G tuning. <laughs> Actually in G. So that's pretty good recording there. Uh, the guitar is a little heavy in the mix, so let's see if we can get some. Uh, better intelligence here off of some other recordings. Uh, I'm sticking with YouTube here. Um, looks like... Oh, here we go. Here's her playing live. So, uh, a Cripple Creek. One of the highlights of this weekend for me is... Yeah, mostly... You can see all the other folks up there on stage with her who are probably all well-known musicians. You see them all staring at her while she plays because they're also trying to figure out what she's doing, right? Everybody wants to know. So what I think I'm seeing there, and it sounds like I'm kind of hearing, is a two-finger style. Sounds like it. And one thing, if you back up, you know, if I back up here, um, this right here looks like it's actually Etta playing on this, uh, what I assume is probably a homespun instructional video from back in the day. Let's go back to the mail. Yeah, it's... Look at that right hand. I think she was a right-handed player. Um, the picking hand two fingers right she's using her uh, thumb and an index really cool vibe you get from that two finger style on guitar so my guess is same style on the banjo and that's what it looks like too when uh, when we look at this here video get about right there See where they is. Start 
started out the session in a very weird tuning, so I'll probably be tuning a lot. First thing I'm hearing, you know, I'm hearing a bing digga digga digga. I'm hearing a lot of uh, G notes on the high G and also on the first string. Um, I heard some pinch, some uh, subsequent pinching in there. So all I'm doing is just kind of listening, really in intuitively kind of grabbing the general approach. So what I'm hearing in her general approach is on this, there seems to be some finger lead style. So she's playing index and thumb. I'm always more comfortable with middle and thumb. <laughs> But finger thumb, right? And it seems like a finger lead style, at least on this Cripple Creek that she's doing. It sounds like a, a finger lead, two finger style. to give it a little more time uh, maybe we'll do that in the near future uh, I might stick with this for a second though gonna slow it down Seems to me, I'd say uh, my preliminary conclusions are we're looking at it's a two finger style. Uh, looks like some thumb and some finger lead, so kind of switching back and forth is my preliminary conclusion. I could spend, you know, a good 30, 40 minutes with this and get get a much better answer for you, Beeps. But uh, that's kind of fun and worth exploring. If we have time at the end of this session, I think I'll just jump back here. Uh, but I think a lot of the answers would probably be in finding. You know, when you explore the stuff on your own, find the resources that will give you the visual clues you need and, and some other stuff. So I could find, instead of a blurry video of her playing the banjo, I could go back to this guitar video that you all can't see yet. But, uh, do, do, do. Do, do, do. And... Oh. 
So there, right in this particular example, she's playing alternate thumb, kind of typical finger picking guitar style, alternate thumb, with the fingers playing the upbeats and some and the melody upbeat notes. Uh, the banjo sounded like it might have been a slightly different approach, but uh, worth checking out. I'm um, curious what other resources are out there about her banjo playing too. Now that we're we're deep, deep in. I'm gonna grab some other. Uh, here's a Etta Baker finger style, same thing maybe. Oh yeah, I've got the wrong. I'm logged in the wrong way. Getting some ads here. Da, 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 da. Here we got a little note. If you listen to Etta ba Baker's music, you'll notice a constant alternating bass line and a snappy, bright, picked melody. He's talking about guitar, of course, but. Again, talking about that alternating bass, kind of a classic finger-picking guitar approach in the country folk world. Uh, yeah, so a little micro Etta Baker or exploration there. Pretty cool. Like I said, we'll get back to that if we have time later. Uh, let me see if we got some more questions. We have one in the YouTube chat. By the way, folks, this is a ask me anything. So get in there if you got some questions you want answered or anything banjo ish related. We'll get to talking about it. Um, have you ever played an Appalachian dulcimer? Yes, I certainly have. I've owned a few. I believe I own one now, although I, obviously I haven't played it much lately. Yeah, and I believe I have one down in my pile of uh, instruments downstairs. Yeah, I've played a little bit of Appalachian dulcimer. Um, I'm by no means any kind of expert on it, but when I was a teenager and just, just kind of in my early days of playing this kind of music with some friends of mine, we ended up uh, in a band in a trio configuration with uh, a feller by the name of Jack Geiger, wonderful dulcimer player and uh, builder. Uh, I saw Jack a few years ago down in Mountain View, Arkansas, where he lives now. Um, and he really opened our eyes to the mountain dulcimer. We were well aware of it and had both owned one. And a lot of times with the mountain dulcimer, it's tuned. D-A-D -D is pretty standard tuning. And then you'll have a chorus D on top. So just a double, two D strings that just match like a mandolin style. So you just have like the one and the five of your your D right and then most folks would just fret a single that single chorus string and then strum the others for uh, harmony so it would be like uh, see if I can emulate it Of using my fingers to fret and mute certain strings to try to emulate that three string sound of a open dulcimer. Uh, so it's pretty simple and friendly to play if you play it in that kind of traditional style where you just fret the one string. A lot of people use a little little dowel to fret that one string as well. And uh, it's similar to like a harmonica or a concertina where it limits the amount of notes, a traditional Appalachian dulcimer, the way you see them these days. You pretty much just have your diatonic notes on there with maybe a uh, flatted seventh note added in. So it's really similar to like a harmonica where if you just kind of get rolling, you can intuitively get some good harmonic sounds coming out of it. So it's a great instrument to learn on and, and just to pick up and have a little fun with. Uh, it's probably a great one to have for kids, I think. Um, and then people like Jack Geiger and a, and a ton of other folks out there. Uh, we'll take that instrument way beyond what you see most people do, and you'll see folks playing jazz and complicated stuff on those things. And uh, flamenco, there was a fellow that I met when I was younger named Alfonso. Mm, can't remember his last name, but he was very well, very, very good uh, dulcimer player, and he could play flamenco and jazz and pop tunes on that thing. So, yeah, I'm familiar with Appalachian dulcimer good source uh, check out gene ritchie if you're looking to check out some 
classic Appalachian dulcimer uh, you know, rabbit hole. Start with Gene Ritchie maybe and see see where you end up, see where the internet takes you. Uh, but yeah, I'm a I'm a fan of all things folky and dulcimers. No exception. I don't you know, personally I don't don't pick one up very often. I find them not as versatile but as other instruments, so it's it's there's fewer times when I pick pick them up, but they're just they're just really cool, and I like I like all instruments. We started out today talking about how I I might pick up a a quattro, a Puerto Rican quattro here next week. So we'll see we'll see what happens. But I like to uh, add different flavors to the mix. Speaking of, so here's another good point to make jumping off from that question about Appalachian dulcimer. Yes, I have one. I have uh, I have a concertina. I have multiple banjos of different configurations. I have tenor banjos. I have some a makeshift plectrum banjo. I have t uh, three five string banjos. I have steel string. I have malgut. I have fiddles, uh, mandolins, guitar, acoustic guitars. Don't currently have any electrics. Why am I telling you this? I have a piano out, out in the living room. There is so much to learn by jump, you know, trying to transfer any knowledge you have from one instrument to another. Um, so, for instance, say you start on the mountain dulcimer and then later you decide to pick up a banjo. There's so many parallels there that you, some of them you're going to pick up right away, you're going to make the connection right away. Others you'll discover as you go. Uh, but there's, I think it's so good for the, the conceptual part of your musical brain to actually explore different modes. So from time to time, you'll hear me recommending like, hey, put your banjo down and pick up an instrument you don't know very well, or maybe at all, um, and try to see what you can do with this musical knowledge that you're used to applying on one single mode using one single mechanism, like for instance, a five string banjo. See what happens if you, can I take any of that sound and play it on a keyboard? I don't know. You know, can I play it on a concertina or a uh, yeah, penny whistle. I like all instruments pretty much. Right? Like just like to mess around with them. And I think it's really helpful for the musical brain to just kind of try to experiment and try to explore with different instruments. It doesn't you don't have to master any of them. You don't have to have any grand aspirations, but um, one thing it does is it frees you up to be a little more playful and experimental. Once you start learning a little bit on an instrument, you start to get a little serious about it. I'm getting pretty good on the banjo. I need to focus and, ex you know, build up my skills. Well, that's great. That's, that's a great attitude, but let's make sure there's still play in there. We play these instruments, right? We don't want to just work these instruments. We want to play them. We, we use the verb play when we're talking about music. So there's a lot of work and study involved if you want to kind of open up the possibilities and make the play more dynamic but ultimately, we're we're playing around, right? We're we're there's no other no better word for it. We're playing. So make sure um, that you're getting enough play in your musical study. And a lot of times, a great way to do that is to pick up another instrument, um, a harmonica, as I just mentioned. Harmonicas are also very friendly for uh, just kind of intuitive musical noodling. Um, all right, there we go. Another little mini lecture from Ryan. I recorded a lesson earlier today. There's a bunch of mini lectures in there for the members, folks in the members area. You'll see that tomorrow if you're watching this in real time. We're all in the same spot here in the space-time continuum. All right, a few more comments and questions. What are your go-to tricks or methods for improvising? Can you talk about doing it in G and double C and tips for up the neck? That's a lot there, Rick. But yeah, I'll talk about as much of that as I can. So I started to learn, uh, and then Gora says, I started to learn clobber banjo for a while, but now I notice the pain in my hand is sort of brushing the... Oh, the palm of my hand is brushing the head. Any tips on how to prevent that? I'm going to answer these questions in reverse. So... Gora, the the palm the palm of your hand brushing the head. I assume you're talking about up here. This kind of thing. Um, you know, tips for preventing that. My 
I don't know if you'll find this satisfying or not, but my tip would be I wouldn't try too hard to prevent it. I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's very interesting. I find it interesting over the years, the different ways that people perceive the percussive part of playing a claw armor banjo, especially in the beginning. You might find, you know, you're putting a lot of effort and thought into all this coordination. You might get a lot of banging and clanging, usually with that palm right there, or the thumb. It's usually kind of the thumb, and the palm is probably what you're talking about there. You can get a lot of banging and slapping. And people are, some people are concerned that it's bad technique and it's a problem. It's not, if you don't mind how it sounds. There's no problem with slapping that head. Other folks ask me the question from the other angle. They say, hey, how do I get all that percussion going? I hear people playing percussion when they play claw hammer on the head. And most people aren't actually intentionally doing that. It's just kind of happening, right? Like, like it's happening to you. Just kind of slapping the head. So some folks actually like that. And I do find that most folks in the early stages, there's a lot more slapping and pop clapping on the head unintentionally. Uh, it usually kind of cleans up as you go, and then you can decide later, and I'm guessing that's kind of your motivation here, is you want to say, how can I not, how can I stop unintentionally slapping my palm on the head of the banjo, and then later, if you do want that sound at any time, you should just be able to do it. Um, yeah, again, I don't think it's so bad unless it's really distracting if it's, if it's a heavy issue if it's distracting you physically or it's distracting you sonically or if you think it's not a good experience for the listener then yeah you're going to want to work with that um, all i would recommend i guess technically is you can you can create some angle here in your wrist now i play in a pretty flat style it almost looks like i'm hyper extended sometimes when you watch the videos i'm really not but sometimes i, I do have a pretty flat angle to like to how my wrist is, right? Uh, you see a lot of players play with much more of an angle here. So I would say if you're worried about this slap, slap, slapping, this would be my advice to try out, see if it works. Imagine there's a little puppet string connected to you right here. You don't want to put a bunch of tension in there to, to crick that up. Just imagine that there's a little puppet string there and just pick up that wrist from that angle. That's going to clear the palm a little bit. So when I do that, you notice right when I start playing, I kind of even out. Because <laughs> that's just where I naturally play more of a flatter angle. Um, but when I started out by kind of doing this little conceptual, this kind of little exercise mentally, Physically, I picked up that wrist, and then I started playing. Well, now what I had done is I kind of repositioned my arm a little bit. Not on purpose. Just kind of picking up the imaginary puppet string. Kind of repositioned me. So then even when I did straighten back out, I'm still up a little more than I normally would be. So look for adjustments you can make. You can make some minor adjustments here where your what part of your forearm are, is resting on the head. Little angles here. People get really concerned about proper technique. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of ways to get a good claw hammer sound, and that goes for most techniques, really. you got to watch out for techniques that are going to be uh, maybe cause injury, but you will you kind of know when those are happening because you'll feel excess tension and inability to usually make much noise. So. Um, so I would trust your body a little bit, experiment a little bit, and just simply lift that palm up and experiment with some technique approaches where you're not so hard on the head. If you do find you have kind of a, something like a hyper-extended situation here, which you might if you're getting a lot of slapping, that's probably not good. There's a lot of tension there. You know, we get a lot more tension here than we do here because here we can relax everything and get this kind of angle. Here, we're tensing everything, most everything, from here to here. So that's usually not good. It's not going to create fluidity in our playing. It's going to create undue tension here, which will cause various problems. Um, so that would be my advice. Hopefully those little bits of advice will be helpful. And yes, I got a confirmation. That's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, that little slap, slap, slap. 
Yeah, some people love that sound too. So, uh, let's let's delve into Rick's question. I love it. Like I said, there's a lot there, but I, I explore these all the time in the in the members areas, as a lot of you know. And sometimes we might be on a session where we're focusing on something else, but we'll still get into a little bit of these improvisational ideas. So let's see if in the next five to ten minutes, five to eight minutes, let's see if I can uh, summarize my approach um Gora saying thanks for the tips I do like the percussion but it was more the brushing I found a bit too much I'll go and try some stuff around yeah yeah dude just experiment and just come back and ask some questions if you continue to have them and I think I think we'll get you where you need to be um so back to Rick's question. What are your go-to tricks or methods for improvising? Can you talk about doing it in G and double C tips for up the neck? Um, let's see if I can like summarize this. I have done it in a lot of different lessons. Uh, let's pull up a whiteboard. We got to have a whiteboard for this kind of stuff. Uh, at least to help you kind of understand what in the world I'm talking about. Because I'll probably throw a lot of terms out at you. If some of it's over your head or just moving too fast, you can always go back, skip to this part of the video, archive, slow me down if you need to. Most people need to speed me up, but sometimes you got to slow me down. Let's get rid of my howdy guy over here as well. Clean palette. Let's go big. Question, what are your go-to tricks and methods for improvising? Here's the first tip I always give people for improvising is... And it annoys people sometimes. I used to give this in, in my folk school classrooms a bit. People would get annoyed, but they'd come around. So tip number one is don't improvise. Memorize. So this is not a long-term strategy, but this is a great place to start. Because when we're improvising, one thing to understand is, yes, we are creating spontaneously, right? And there's a lot that goes into that, a lot of knowledge and a lot of training of the body and the mind that goes into being able to improvise in a, in a high level. But nothing that we're doing is truly, I should say most of what we're doing is not truly just inspired, you know, inspired decision making. It's all built on repetition and reusable patterns and we're, we're using techniques and licks and all this which is what you're asking about so step one for improvising is improvise or, or work up a solo for a couple tunes or songs that you already know so i don't know what context you're interested in improvising to me i think you should always be able to improvise in any musical context uh, so whether you're adding variations and embellishments to a fiddle tune or whether you're taking a blue solo or a solo you're jamming with a rock band or whatever it shouldn't matter if you understand all of the elements that go into improvising, you should be able to survive in most of those situations and maybe even get some good results. Okay, long that's a long way to get to point number one. Play a play the actual melody. So this takes premeditation for most people. So let's say we're playing Worried Man Blues. This is what I used to use in my classes a lot when we talk about this. We're playing Worried Man Blues in the key of G. It takes Worried Man to sing Worried Song. Takes a worried man to sing a worried song. Takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried now. Take it away, Ryan. the notes in there see what i was doing there i was i was just playing the melody as best i could so step number one for improvisation just play the melody most of us can't just grab any old melody uh, on the fly by ear and intuition and experience you'll get there or you get close um, but maybe you start and you don't even you just prepare maybe you know you're going to a jam or you're where you kind of know where some of the songs are going to be or you know you're playing with certain people and you have a set repertoire just learn the melody as best you can and even if you're not doing a right hand technique i 
Now, why do I tell you that? Well, one, it's going to sound good to anybody, whether it's the other musicians you're playing with or just people listening. They're going to hear that and go, yes, that's what's supposed to be happening. <laughs> but they know what they're doing because I can hear the melody in there that, that they've been singing. Now it's happening on the banjo. Great. Success. Yes, it's not technically improvising if you've premeditated it, but that's where I say to start with improvisation because um, it's going to get you really familiar with where these melodies are lying on your fretboard in these different tunings. You asked about the open G tuning and you asked about the double C tuning. Well, there's going to be some common notes that you're going to come across over and over and over, common patterns on the, on the instrument in those various tunings. And the more melodies you learn, just straight melodies in those tunings, the more you kind of get a feel and a visualization of where those groups of notes are and kind of how they function within various uh, chord progressions and stuff like that. A lot of that can be intuitive if you just learn a lot of melodies. So a lot of folks have had a lot of success just learning, learning, learning melodies. And then when it comes time to improvise, they try to just copy and paste. It's not a terrible approach. Take little pieces of the melodies you've already learned and see if you can just kind of throw them onto a song in the same key. Um, <clears throat> so step one, just learn learn some melodies, especially like if you know you're going to improvise on these three songs next week. Worried Man Blues, uh, Cripple Creek, and Crawdad Song. Then learn the melody, just the melody line and start there. And what, what you'll find is the other thing, the reason I make people do this in our classroom settings is then once it's time to play your pre-made melody, most of us kind of fall apart at some point. So you might start and think, I'm not even improvising, but I'm going to play Worry Man Blues. Then you kind of forget where it is, but you kind of know the notes are here. Next thing you know, you are improvising, because once you're in the in real time trying to play a premeditated thing, if that's not solidly locked in, or you get distracted or whatever, all of a sudden you're no longer on course and now you're you're improvising. So I think working with a pre-made melody is the best way to get into improvising. It kind of gives you a clear picture of what you're going to be working around, gives you a place to start, and then once you start losing your way, it kind of gives you a map that you can try to get back to. Next step is, I told you, you learn all those melodies, you start seeing these recurring patterns in your tuning. So... Well, those patterns of safe notes, I call them, the really common notes you'll see among all your melodies and stuff, they tend to just be pentatonic scales. And whether you're familiar with those or not, uh, you know, a quick rapid fire music theory lesson here. I do this all the time. I make people watch this. We go through the whole thing. What's a pentatonic scale? Well, find a major scale, which we build with our Roman numerals, and then I always write it out this way. You write out the half step intervals in between each degree of the scale. Right? And let's say key of G, then you kind of go, oops, then you kind of go through that process. We follow these half steps two half steps, two half steps, one half step, etc. And that tells us where the sharps and flats, all our accidentals are in our scale. So the key of G, G major, we end up with G, A, B, C, D, E, F, sharp, G. A pentatonic scale, if you if you want to derive it just from a major scale, a major pentatonic scale, we just go one, two, three, we skip the four, five, six, and we skip the seven. There are other ways to derive the notes of these scales, but I like to think of it, of it from the major scale point of view. Uh, so now, a G major pentatonic would just be those five notes. Now, if you find, if you look for those on your fretboard, if you've played in G enough, most of us have played in open G quite a bit. Let me extend this. Um, so we'll say our notes are D, G, D, D, right? So we have an open D. That's part of the scale. We have uh, an E note right here, that's part of the scale. Open G will work. An A is in there. B is in there, so we can play our open second string. Uh, our open D works. Our open E works there. We could go all the way up here to our fifth fret on the first string for a G. 
there we go we have a pentatonic scale pattern my friends now notice I could have grabbed the uh, D note right here but we already have it on the open oh, I should have written that up here there we go so look at these notes that we just mapped out we've got we've got a pattern of notes and the interesting thing is if we want to start like if we want to figure out where our root note is like we're doing a G major pentatonic so here's our root note so I just filled in a little green right that G and then also up here is a root note that's another G so that pattern there uh, let's take a look at that you can find these like I said just by learning melodies and paying attention to where the common notes are uh, but if you analyze it you can get rid of those trickier notes a little quicker So now I have open second, open second, open, open second, fifth. And if I know those are some safe notes in the key of G, and I know that my open G, my third string, is a root note, and I know my fifth fret up here is a root note, I'm well along my way to, to play some. Improvised music in G. I need to know where those root notes are for the key, and I need to know what safe notes are there. So I could do the same in double C. I would do it uh, for the key of C. Uh, I tend to, I tend to on the banjo. If I'm not playing all over the place out of the standard open G tuning, then I'll use tuning per key, like double C. I'll just use for the key of C. Uh, an open G tuning, I like to use it for the key of G, obviously, but also I'll do a lot of closed movable shapes but for the quick tips and tricks let's find uh let's find an let's say key of g let's just say bluegrass play along track so i'm back on the internets here bluegrass play along track 100 beats per minute key of g at Asana, we know people work in all sorts of different ways. So. I actually have an ad-free account on YouTube, but not my Play Better Banjo account, so I'm going to turn this ad down. Unless y'all are interested in Asana for your for your work. Okay. Oh, more ads. Let's change my account. Hopefully this doesn't kick us off of YouTube. Hopefully you're all still out there. Got my ad free account. Okay. Oh, got it slowed down. Let's get it back up to speed. Watch this. Uh... <laughs> better tune with I was a little I'm still a little out but let's see if we can get closer Okay, now I'm in a little better tuning. All G pentatonic. So 
Hopefully you can hear how just those open pentatonic notes, those safe notes in the key of G work. That's not a great jam track there. Sorry, fella who put that up there. Um, let's find something that's a little more standard, kind of bluegrassy. That did not strike me as such. We'll try this one. Bluegrass backing tracks. Uh, this one says key of A. Let's just roll with it. Uh, but you should be able to use just those notes. Just capoing up my, my my safe notes, my G major pentatonic notes here. Those notes, uh, just those pentatonic notes, will work. Even though I didn't even couldn't tell exactly what the progression was was going on there, but I could anticipate some of those one, four, and five notes. So that's that's a good tip there. Just kind of learn melodies first, pay attention to the common notes in those melodies, then try to use those common note patterns, whether you analyze them intellectually and theoretically or not, um, and then start using those. Just use them as single notes at first, like I was just doing, and then you can start integrating them into your picking style. If you're a two or three finger player, um, work it into your rolls and picking patterns. If you're a climber player, work it into your boom chicka strum. Uh, then the next step, on well, my quick, not so quick tips here. Next step is then just I like to go up and do a full octave, second octave just up the first string. So in this case, I'm in open G tuned up to A. We did that kind of octave there. We ended up on a, on a root note, so. That extends that scale. So once you're good in the open position with whatever safe scale collection of notes you're using that you can extend that scale next step is to take make sure I know the chords I'm playing over make sure I do know the chord progression make sure I know the chords and find movable chords and partial versions of those chords so I could take something like this track here make sure I know the chord progression then when they're playing a G a root chord or like a G chord I could find that chord in various places up and down my neck just play a little piece of it you know, I can find a G chord right here. Just play these two notes. Oh, they went to the four chord, the C chord. So I just play a little piece of that chord. So you can play quarterly, or you can play by scale. Um, ultimately, you mix all those up and you throw a few little other spices and seasonings in there as well. But those are the two main modes I think about is playing by chord, you know, playing with a chordal approach or playing with a scalar approach. Um, start the scalar approach just by learning some melodies and finding some some common safe notes there. Hopefully we're still streaming. I changed the counts there. Yeah, we're still good. Uh, hopefully that was helpful for you, Rick. And I think that's going to wrap it up for today. We went well, about our normal, got about our normal hour in there. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, and another bonus one for the YouTubers out there who aren't inside the members area. Let another one go out to the public. Uh, this will be it for our regular weekly ones inside the members area, folks. We're going to, uh, I'll just be doing some pre-recorded uh, question answering once a week along with the weekly lesson. And then we'll do uh, one to two live, uh, live question sessions like this or live sessions anyhow. Uh, but they'll be fairly sporadic. So at least one a month and then 
oftentimes we'll probably get two in there. It'll be during the week, and uh, I'll give you a heads up if you're in the members area, and uh, we'll we'll keep exploring together. So thanks for joining me, folks. Hopefully some of this info helped, and I'll.